One is a critically acclaimed theater director from upstate New York, and the other is a wannabe singer-songwriter who was born in a small town who started his career with Chris Brown Entertainment. Now, if you were thinking EGOT winner Mike Nichols and R&B singer Chris Brown, well, no, not them. Mike Nichols is a critically acclaimed theater director from upstate New York, and Chris Brown is the host of the online show Cross Border Interviews and wants to thank our listener from Australia who found the show and recently messaged us last month with the kind comments, quote, you can't pretend you're Mike Nichols and Chris Brown. They can sue you for defamation and slander, end quote. To which I kindly replied, well, one is dead and the other one can't come into Canada with his criminal past, so let them try to sue us, end quote. Either way, Mike Nichols and Chris Brown talk about the entertainment industry as only two people who aren't the people you are thinking of only can. This is, no, not them. Mike, how are you? I mean, that is my legal name. Like, so you want to sue my, he can sue my parents. Like, I'm not, at, hey, mazel tov to you and yours. And I'm just saying, I had the name Chris Brown before Chris Brown had it, so. <laughs> Whatever. How's it been? How's the last month and a half been? Or month or however long it's been since our last recording, because everything seems to be a blur right now. Yeah, it's kind of been everything everywhere all at once, huh? <sighs> For those who did not hear that, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> how oh, how is it? So how... fucking clever. Well, guys, this oh, is shit. when we jumped the shark. Um, no, I mean, How's it's it been, been busy. It's been good. It's been busy. Uh, my brother in law is in town till January 15th. Um, so it has been, a, and he got here November 15th. So he's been, no, 13th. 13th? I don't know. He's been here. He's going to be here two months. Um, I had my birthday. I officially turned 31. Um, I uh, I don't know. I'm just, I've been reading and existing. Um, I you went to, to the to... Joe Jonas or the Jonas Brothers concert? I which did I saw. go to the tour. Um, we didn't go to New York. Uh, we ended up just, the place we stay is under renovation and um, so it just didn't work out this time around. We're looking at maybe trying to go in January. Um, I'm sad a couple of the shows I wanted to see I'm going to miss because they're going to be closed so soon. Um, but hey, that's show, that's Broadway. That's showbiz. That's the, the theater world. How about you? How are you? I've what is been hearing good things about Gutenberg. Have you? I, I Yes, I really want to see it. And I'm very sad because I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it because it closes in January because it's a limited run. So, oh. so the only reason I've been noticing that it's been picking up steam is because Instagram, for some reason, every time that I talk to you, my Instagram goes crazy. And it's like, here's all the Broadway shit. You're welcome. So, you're welcome. So they have stunt casting, but it's like only like a five second stunt casting for each of the shows. Is that correct? Well, so because I've not seen the show. <laughs> Um, so the premise is it's these two guys that are trying to two real put... people. Well, no, it's Andrew Randall's and Josh Gad. It's a fictional. So it's Andrew <laughs> Randall's and Josh Gad. They're pretend characters trying to put on a musical about Johannes Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press, except they don't have any actual factual information about Johannes Gutenberg. So they're trying to put on this. They're trying to. It's a musical about putting on this fictional musical and it's unhinged. And then they have every night a producer come on and green light their production. And it's always some random celebrity from around town. It's unhinged. My friend Sarah has seen it, I think, 15 times. Um, she's an Andrew Randall super fan. She is his number one fan. And I will fight anyone who says differently. Um, like, Bully will fight anyone who says differently because I she has more dedication than I've ever seen. Um, but it's um, because they play like they don't just play one character each. They play like oh, they play like forty five. Yeah, yeah, and they flip hats or something. Mm -hmm. From what I like, I said, yeah, I don't know why, but this show has been on my Instagram feed for like the last month and a half, and I've been trying to figure out why. But because it's probably one you would like. Probably because I, I I do like Josh Gad and I do like Andrew Randall's, but I'm not like obsessed with them where I need to fly down to New York City tomorrow. She lives in New York City. 
Oh, well, that's that's why she's seen it 15 times. How, isn't that like 40 bucks a pop or 100 bucks a pop? Sometimes she gets the wins the lottery for it. Sometimes she um, okay. like so she's got way, but she's also a huge fan of his and likes to support everything he does. And I'm like, all right, come on, pop off, sis. <laughs> okay. I love I love her. I love her to death. I love shout her to out death. to who Sarah Gaines. She's a treasure. Sarah- Sarah Gaines, if you're listening to this, what, what? Yeah. I was supposed to see it with, I was literally supposed to see it with her too. We were making plans and I had to message her and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I can't see it with you. And I'm devastated. She's like, we'll just come in January. And I'm like, I don't know if I can. Why not? Oh, just busy, 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 busy. You know me. I never stop moving. You're stopped moving right now. Am I? You don't until, see until a I go to, under here. Until I go to edit this and I go, can you not keep your head in one spot for longer than 10 seconds when you're talking? Oh, wow. I throw you under the bus every single time. That we're talking. Um, I've lost my list of things we are going to talk about. Today. Maybe instead of being mean to me. <laughs> well, that I, I, I go for what my our listeners like and they like at me attacking you for some strange reason. Well, in transitioning from that conversation about musical, that brings us to our first topic. Which when is? When Paltrow's Ski Crash is being off. turned into a musical, premiering on the West End. It's called Gwyneth Goes Skiing, the musical. It is about the trial between Gwyneth Paltrow and that dude that she hit. Didn't I? So I know this is the last episode of 2023. But in 20, earlier this year, I think I asked you to talk about this like three or four times, and you said it's a non-issue because every it was not going to be on the same same stage as like Johnny and Amber against each other. And now I we don't have, know why this is happening. <laughs> what musical director or theater director in uh, or producer in the West End in London is saying? You know what we need? We need a dramedy about a ski accident that is takes place with Gwyneth Paltrow, the uh, creator of the vagina candle. It's um, uh, what's his name? I thought you were going to say our former guest Giles Croft. No, 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 no. It is um, I was going to make a joke and say it was Andrew Lloyd Webber because he'll do anything for a paycheck, but like. It's not him. It's probably just... It, the, here's the thing. It's probably a comedy. Oh, oh no doubt. I, there's I, no how, way this is real. How like, the this hell is, well, do you make this into drama? There's like, it's, there's like no way that like it's a drama. It's it's real. It's a, gotta be a comedy or it's something. Like It's just unhinged. I hope the final song is I Wish You Well. That's what she said to him as she was leaving. She whispered it into his ear <laughs> with a microphone on. <laughs> She's a fucking moron. I can't stand it. It's how listen. much do you want to bet she's going to get money from this? Oh, she's probably the one producing it. Are you kidding me? It's going to be goop produced by goop. <laughs> she's probably trying to make back her money that she had to pay for lawyer fees for fuck's sake. <laughs> oh, Christ. Oh, my God. So we are. 10 not even 10 minutes into this and we're talking about vagina smells and goop i wasn't talking about vagina smells (laughs) that was all you um but as as i was saying before i was interrupted wow wow i came for you um this is our last episode of 2023 and there's a lot that we uh, we were trying to figure out what we were going to talk about because we are on empty. And <laughs> if you're watching this right now, you can tell that we are on empty. Uh, we are exhausted, but we always want to make sure we bring your best foot forward because we know that our listeners from across Canada and the United States and now Australia. Hi, Australia. My name is Chris Brown. Uh, have come to expect from us nothing but us attacking each other while we discuss issues. Um, you, you have, from our last conversation in November, ran out and picked up a book that was released in 2023, actually in February of 2023, and that is from the heiress to the Hilton fortune, Miss Paris Hilton herself, 
Uh, how'd you like the book? What'd you think of it? What was there any good, bad, or ugly parts of it, or was it overall just a great story from beginning, middle, and end? Uh, it's probably in my top five books of the year, and I'm currently at 91 books read. Um, it was, you could tell it was written by her, not a ghostwriter, because you can usually tell with these things. And it was just very honest. And it talked about her time basically in the troubled teen prison industrial complex that her parents sent her to for a hundred pages. Very graphically, it talked about like the assault, the abuse, the starvation that they did to her, like the sexual assault they did to her. Like she was very honest and very graphic. Like if you've seen her documentary, like it makes this look like a walk, like it makes this look like that was a walk in the park. Like it was very open and it talked about her as like a marketing person and, and about, you know, a lot of the stuff that has happened to her. She really didn't become like famous, famous until the simple life happened, which was after basically all this other shit had happened. She was like going to clubs, she was doing things, but she was I, a Z-list celebrity. No, no, but can can I challenge you a little bit on that for sure. a second? Sure. I, I would agree with you. She wasn't really a known quantity until Simple Life, but she really wasn't a known quantity. And this, this I'm not sure if she speaks about it in the book, but she really didn't become famous. And I use the words famous, like an actual B-list, A-list actor, actress or someone, A-list celebrity, I should say. And I don't, I, I hate putting it this way because it's, it's going to sound very sexual, but I think she really, be, she really got on a lot of more people's radar after the sex tape. Well, the sex tape and the simple life were the same time. No, and that's what I mean, because the simple life came out and then it wasn't like, oh, we all have to watch it. And then the sex tape came out or it came out beforehand. One or the other. No, the sex the... tape came out beforehand because she then... was worried the simple life was going to tank because of it. Yeah. Okay, so she actually does talk about the tape oh, yeah. in the book. Okay. Oh, very graphically. And then she reached out to the guy that she had made it with. She's like, why would you release that? And he goes, because I could make money on it and you're an idiot. And like very like, like she talked in depth about it and, and how it affected her and how she was worried about it affecting her career. And like at that point she was trying, her and Nicole Richie were trying to do this whole thing. And like, she was starting to come up and it was sort of at the same time. And it's what made the simple life such a big. Well, hit. and that's, what I, that's also, what I mean. So like the simple life, do you think the simple life would have been the same if the sex tape hadn't come out? Yes. The simple life was already filmed. So the sex tape came. No, so the, okay. So the simple life was filmed. Then the sex tape came out after the simple life was already filmed. And then, so she was about to enter into the PR time when they were talking about it. So they had, she predicts more viewers watching the first episode because of the sex tape, but people stuck around because the show was what it was. That show was great. Whether you were, it, like, it was one of those things where you're watching these rich girls, like, be unhinged and try and do, like, everyday jobs with being so respectful about it. And, like, actually trying to, like, do these jobs and and be committed and they were having fun in the towns they were in and like it was a really great tv show and it's been one that they've been trying to capture the magic of but it's it the sex tape brought people to that show but her and who she is as a person kept people watching and that's she talks about that and she's like she even says you know would this show have been a huge hit without the sex tape i don't know we never got the chance to try and figure out if it would, if I could have, because someone took that off, took that um, autonomy away from me by Did releasing. Did you ever sue him? Yeah, but by then it was, it, it's on the internet. I can say get rid of this on the internet, but 45 million people have already downloaded it and pop it up whenever they want to and put it back on the internet. Yep. And then we had sex tape after sex tape after that, because right after that, that's when sort of the sex tape craze sort of took off with like Tommy Lee Jones and Pamela Anderson, which we're going to talk about her in a few seconds here as well. And then even Kim Kardashian, I know that she did one, but I don't remember who it was with. I think it was with a celebrity. I could be wrong. Um, but overall, it sounds like it was a very sort of like it, it breaks the mold of what we talked about in our last episode with uh, uh, talking about these biographies and they sort of gloss over the 
gritty parts and they only look at the sun, sunshine and roses, right? It depends on the person. Cause like I've read, I've read, I think 10 autobiographies this year and certain ones were very honest and certain ones were not. And I think that that's really the big thing with looking at it is who's alive and who's not and who's willing to burn a bridge and who's not. Cause Paris Hilton even says in it, she's like, my mom's going to read this and she might not finish it. And she may not like what I have to say. My mother and I are working through everything that happened to me, but she's like, this is just the reality of it. She's not afraid to piss people off. Someone like the Tom Felton autobiography I read, I think he was more worried about pissing people off and was a little less honest. Um, Cause like Jeanette McCurdy's, she wrote, uh, I'm glad my mom died and it was mom was dead. So it doesn't matter how scathing she wants to be about mom. And all the people that she was really against have all been outed in the Me Too movement. Like, there's a lot of stuff she talked about in hers that was like, well, it doesn't, it's not going to burn a bridge because they're already either dead or had their life's bridge burned. So I, I asked you this uh, in our last recording, but I'm going to ask it again. So you've read uh, Paris Hilton's book now. How much do you take it as gospel and how much do you take it with a grain of salt? Because there's always that, this is the one side of the story, right? And don't get sure. wrong, I've not read the book and I'm assuming she goes into graphic details as I believe what you're telling me right here, right now. Um, but how much of it were you going, okay, I see her side, but now I wish if Celebrity X or Celebrity B would have come out and sort of respond to this and sort of either confirm it or make uh, sort of say it didn't happen this way. Or in, or if you're a politician, uh, the, 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 the sequence of events that you're talking about are not what I remember. Um, I mean, there's two, there's three sides to every story, your side, my side and the truth. And so I think with hers, it's very honest. I think she owns up to a lot of things she did wrong, even in the troubled teen stuff. She's like, at the time, because she goes, at the time I was 15 and running all over New York and being like, I'm an adult, I can do what I want. And my parents are worried sick, thinking their daughter's dead because they haven't seen her in three days at 14 or 15 years old. And so like, she owns up to where she's like, yeah, what happened to me in that place was awful. And especially with what she describes being in the troubled teen and like industrial complex, there's so many people that have come forward and corroborated. And if you look up anything with CEDU, um, C-E-D-U, they basically got shut down in 2006 and like had serial killers that were outed as being staff members there that they hired. And like a lot, there was a laundry list of allegations against them and leading them to be closed because it was started by a cult leader. Like it, wow. oh yeah, it's, it's when, when I tell you I was my mouth was on the floor as I read this book in like 24 hours I could not put it down it was it was intense but it was it was a really good honest read but like it, is every interaction she had with celebrities real no like she talks about how uh pink wrote stupid girl about her and she, how, cause it came out around the time of the sex tape and it was talking like, and a lot of the lyrics lined up and I'm like, it may have been inspired by you, but it may not have been entirely about you. But like, also I could see it being the case. Like, so it's like, it's your side, my side, the truth. So it's her side, pink side, the <laughs> truth. Okay. Um, while we are on uh, autobiographies for a quick second, I want to just give you a quick moment to talk about Pamela Anderson's new book or a sort of book, a uh, famous Canadian. While we, while as, as Canadians, we don't accept the British Columbia Canadians. Uh, we will. We You're going to get canceled for that. Carl, you got canceled for hating Taylor Swift. I got canceled for hating Beyonce. So honestly, it, it, this is why what this is why for those who are listening in Australia, that's Mike Nichols and I'm Chris Brown, not the goddamn fucking guy who's dead and the other one who's fucking a criminal. Wait, go ahead. Simmer down. It's been a long month, okay? Apparently. Um, Pamela, Pamela Anderson. Anderson. How how's her, her book? Her and Tommy really Lee Jones it. on good good uh, footing after that book. Yeah, I, she she's very. Again, I think this is one she wrote herself. There's a lot of poetry in it. It was really beautifully written. Um, she talks about Tommy. She talks about how he 
is and was probably the love of her life, but they were not good for each other. And she talks about how the sex tape being leaked, not by them also. It was not leaked by them. It was a whole Disney Plus movie. Yeah. Well, they she she owns it. She's like, oh yeah, we filmed it ourselves. Of course we filmed it. She's like, we were filming everything. We were in love and we just put it in our our safe. And when we came home, all of a sudden this we noticed the safe was broken into and not thinking anything of it. We didn't realize the sex tape was in there. And then months later it was leaked and we tried to hunt down the guy who did it and um all this other stuff she talked about. And but she was like, that was what ruined our relationship was the sex tape. She was like, we were madly in love and then after the sex tape everything became about that and like people wanting to view her negatively and she talked about her time at uh with Hugh Hefner and everything that happened at the Playboy Mansion and it was a very like it was very wholesome the book that she like what she wrote it was very honest it it, it was I mean it was very poetic on the same level as Paris no Paris's was I think Paris has had more unfortunate, like really traumatic things happen. So Paris's was much more gritty or it was grittier. It was, it was a little more raw than Pamela Anderson's Pamela talked about everything that kind of happened. And, and she, I mean, she made um, news when she talked about Tim Allen exposing himself to her on the Tim, the tool man show. Um, and like her? he, um, yeah. And then she, yeah. And then he went and on US Weekly and said that he never did that. It's so like, I, I mean, I could totally see him doing it. I'm not even going to lie, allegedly doing it. But I um, don't want to ruin was, the reputation of Mike Nichols, do you? <laughs> I don't care. Um, but it was it was a good read. It was a really good read. I was really shocked at how much I enjoyed it. I really like Pamela Anderson and she's another one. She got, because a sex tape got leaked against her will, she got painted as a stupid woman. And because she was a playboy bunny, she got painted with this like very broad brush of being an idiot. And she's very intelligent. She's also on very good terms with her children. Um, And like reading about her relationship with her kids was really lovely. Um. I don't want to spend too much time on sex tapes on this. There's a lot of sex tapes today. I don't know why, but I, so we, we didn't even talk. We didn't even mention this. So speaking of sex tapes, Kim Kardashian has a new TV show coming out. Does she? Where she's the lead actress and guess who's producing it. Ryan Murphy. Yep. And it's a legal drama. Oh, well, she just did uh, that American Horror Story season and apparently she was incredible on it. I could not watch it because it was about spiders and I don't do spiders. Um, apparently it was incredible. Well, she is, uh, I don't know if she's once, because I know that she was there going there for a while trying to be a lawyer like her dad, but it seems like she's found her niche in acting and being Ryan Murphy's next muse. And maybe that is going to take Leah Michelle out of the running to be Ryan Murphy's muse. So here we are. Yay. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking about sex tapes for a while because I feel like we've talked too much about them <laughs> on, on the Christmas episode of no, not Merry that. Christmas. <laughs> um, I don't know what I wrote to begin the, this list, but all I have on the first story is BJ on the leg. What the- oh, <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. So Britney Spears' father. Oh, BS. Okay. I was like, just low job on the leg. What the hell am I talking about here? He just got his leg amputated. Oh, thoughts and prayers. My my thought and prayer is with him. Mm-hmm. Thoughts and prayers. What, what happened? Diabetes? I don't know. I just saw oh. he got his leg amputated and said, "All right." Okay, well, there's that story done then. <laughs> uh, what does a congressman and a drag queen have in common? They both had to sashay away. <laughs> both had to sashay away, and both of them can't compete on RuPaul's Drag Race. And they're both from New York, Sherry Pie and whatever the other George Santo is. And um, he got a cameo. He's on cameo now. You can get George <laughs> Santos cameoing for you. So, when I'm you sorry. said that. When you said that, I was like, is that what it was? And I had to look before we started recording. Um, John Fetterman, senator from uh, the great state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, bought a cameo of 
George Santos and used it as a campaign push to get Bob uh, Mendez or whatever his name is, the senator from New Jersey. Uh, and it's like, Bob, uh, if you, you don't let the haters uh, knock you down, <laughs> like you just have to stand and take names. I'm like, wow, how far the not mighty have fallen. <laughs> George Santos is unhinged. I kind of adore him when he's not running our country, my country. <laughs> Your country. I'm like, country. you're not my country. My country's fucked already. Yours is just fucked. <laughs> okay. Um. Then I have, I, I don't, this is the worst thing. Is it Jodie Foster? I have Oats. Oh, Holland Oats are currently in a legal battle. Um, so Holland Oats. For those who are wondering, I have not slept that well over the last month. I started a new clinical trial, which basically means my back is killing me. And every time I move, uh, I cannot sleep properly. So I have gotten like two hours of sleep every night since the last time I recorded. And I am exhausted. And I have an interview in about three hours after recording this with someone from New Zealand, and I'm not looking forward to it. For those who are watching from New Zealand, tune into the Grass Party interviews. It'll be a fun show. All um, and Go ahead. So Hall and Oates are currently in a legal battle. There's there's a restraining order against each other, and like, is it a man just, eater? Uh, one of them was, or something. But they are falling apart. Oh, I got your joke. I'll give you your off high five. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> okay, uh, so well, has this been coming down the wire for a while? Because didn't they split up in the nineties or something like that? Like, weren't they like on and off? Like, aren't they like worse than Finn Hudson and Rachel Berry on Glee? We're hot, we're cold, and then we're gonna. Did you watch <laughs> Glee recently? This is like two Glee references in one sitting, and like. Are you rewatching it? Are you on a, I, Are you on that journey? I'm, I'm rewatching all the Christmas episodes. I'm trying to get in the Christmas spirit before my mother gets out here next week. And I can tell you right now, um, Santa's not coming down my chimney because that fat man's not going to fit through it because there's no Christmas spirit to open up that hole. No Christmas spirit. Which is ironic because if you're watching this on YouTube, I have a red background with a white shirt on right now. Like this is like quintessential Christmas right now. But anyway, we love Christmas. Eh. I'm, I'm like so a Hallmark. S- I'm like a Hallmark movie right now. I'm that upstate New York girl who's just <laughs> wanting to make it in the real world and then going out to the farm and finding his man. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Hall and Oates. They're dead. They're not dead. <laughs> They're fighting. The girls are fighting. Mom and dad are fighting. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I feel like these two, it's like Fleetwood Mac. They fight and then they make up and then they go on a tour and then they fight again. I was going to say, are they, have they not been on tour for the last like three months or three years? No. So maybe this is their comeback special for their 50th release of their first album in the 80s. And then who knows? Uh, my know. thoughts and prayers are with them. I don't know who they are. I'm, Paul I and Oates. Know, I only know one of their songs, so I can't say. I know them from Will and Grace. They were on that show once. So they're pretty prolific. They've, their music's pretty good. I think you'd like it. I probably have listened to them. I just I only know the one song, Man Eater. I think there's another one too. Build me a buttercup. What other no. songs? Are, what other songs? I so, almost said hungry like a wolf and then I'm that's, like that's uh, Duran Duran. Yeah. Uh Hall and Oats songs. Yeah, they're super prolific. Ask me what their songs were. I don't fucking know. You can make your elevator dreams. music. I, I can't, can't go for that. You make my dreams come true. Oh, that was ugly as well then. Yeah. That was season three. That was season three. When so you're Irish- rewatching Glee, <laughs> you're just rewatching Glee. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Okay, got a problem with that? Deal with it. Gotta deal with it. Okay. Oh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah, come right by the north. You've lost that love and feeling. 
one on one, say it ain't so. You make my dreams. Okay. Um, so we good with hollow notes. Yeah, we're good with hollow notes. Are you good with hollow notes? <laughs> For those who are watching this or listening to this right now, we apologize. We're usually more prepared than this. It's just we are both extremely Michael's hair looks fantastic. No, it doesn't. It's just I need a haircut. Okay. Here's a here's the place that I'm actually gonna have something to comment on that I can actually bring something to this discussion besides of me trying to look like I, I watch Glee every day. Um, Jodie Foster came out saying that the Marvel Super Mirror Hero uh, franchise has run its course, has jumped the shark, and is basically a passing fad. Um, I'm actually going to have to agree with her. I don't see many people going to the theaters or uh, hyping up the superhero franchise that once was the dominant force in the cinema five years ago, 10 years ago, when it first started out, Iron Man and Captain America. I think she has hit the money right on the nail. I think people are fed up, but I think it's not just because they're at the theaters. I think it's they're fed up because they just want to sit at home and not go sit in a theater anymore and watch a three-hour movie with people surrounding them chewing loudly on fucking popcorn. So I agree with Jodie Foster on this one that the superhero franchise movie might be uh, coming to an end. I think it's still going to be around. I just don't think it's going to be as prolific or as prominent as it once was. Do you agree? I didn't interpret the article that way. How do you? I interpret it as her saying that she um, didn't think that there that she thought that it was displacing other movies and and was kind of very much like against it that way. And I think there's a place for both films, for both very artistic films like she does and for the Marvel Universe films. I do think that, because uh, Iman Veli came forward and and she's a huge Marvel Oh, she's fan. been going crazy, eh? But like what she's been saying, that's a lot. Exactly. Oh, she has been basically running uh, Kevin Feige up the wall and back the other wall. And it's like, holy crap. And then Bob Iger is just going crazy, too, with everything that's going on in Disney right now. Like uh. she what she said, you know, and it makes sense. There needs to be stronger writing. We need to care about the characters. We don't maybe need to dump 400 superheroes out there for this big epic thing. Like Endgame was phenomenal. That is one of the like biggest cinematic things I think I've gotten to witness in my life. It was a huge moment in history with all these movies building up to it. They're trying to recreate that with the Kang dynasty, but they're also the reason that Avengers took off is it was four movies, four or five movies. And then the Avengers, it was only really six focused heroes. And then they slowly added in everyone else. This they're trying to keep us with all the people they already have, plus the TV shows, plus this. There's like 45 new characters in the last like three years since Endgame to keep up with. I, I can't, I can't keep up with all. And it's so it's weaker writing because they're trying to pump out six TV shows a year and four movies rather than focusing on let's do, you know, let's strengthen the material we have. To, I don't necessarily quote Bob Iger. It's quality over quantity. Yeah. It needs to be quality over quantity. And it's not saying that necessarily all of the new Marvel movies have been bad. They've just been weaker. And when you have such strong movies to start, it, it shows a glaring thing. It, it's glaringly obvious that it's weaker. And it me makes people think, wow, this movie sucks. It doesn't necessarily suck. It's just a weak film. Yeah. And so, yes and no. Okay. I truly think that the superhero franchise is kind of every there's ebbs and flows, right? There's there's always going to be ebbs and flows in the movie theater because in the nineties, it was all about dinosaurs, right? It was all about dinosaurs and that those like grand scale movies where you'd have to go in the blockbuster summer hits. Now it seems like you said, it's all over the place and no one really wants to have to sit down and watch every single thing that you put out to understand the continuity of a storyline like the great thing about the first two phases of uh, the sort of Marvel Cinematic Universe was you had a movie, then you had a 30 second end credit where it tied in everything. 
Now you have to watch every single fucking movie TV show to understand what new TV show they're talking about. And then you're going, okay, how does this all make sense in the grand scheme? It brings me back to that meme of it's always uh, sunny in Philadelphia where the gentleman's trying to find out who the bad guy is. And there's all these like diagrams on the uh, bulletin board and there's strings tying everything together. It's basically that. And I think that's where I'm getting at is it's run its course. Like the idea of a, a, a superhero movie is no longer a superhero movie. It's a superhero franchise. And I think it's just done. Like I, 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 I still haven't even watched some of the TV shows or even movies. I still haven't seen Guardians of the Galaxy 3 because I'm just so... It was okay. Old. That, plus I just don't like Chris Pratt. I think Chris Pratt is so overrated right now, and I think he is so, like, punchable that I just want to take my fist and ram it through his face. Star-Lord will return in his own movie. That's how they ended it. He's no longer Guardians of the Galaxy, but they're giving him either a TV show or a movie. Um, they are, this, I mean, it's it's the quantity versus quality. Yeah. It's, they're just pumping it out. Whereas they could, like, part of the, t when the TV show started, you had WandaVision, fucking banger. You had, eh. uh, you had, I fucking loved it. You had. I liked Agatha. What, so Agatha was good. The story, continuity, eh. I I don't know why I just I loved okay. it. Then you had Captain and the Falcon, yeah, banger. Oh, Soldier in the folder, yeah, whatever it was called. I it was not necessarily for me, banger. And then I think the next one was Loki. Uh it I was like so. us, like the first. No, Loki, three... Loki was first. Loki, no, was Loki was first. not. No, it wasn't. Mm. Wanda, Wanda Vision was the first one. Anyway, continue then. But like the first three were thought out, were really good, were well written. And then they started pumping them out like candy. Like we have to have one every 10 seconds. And like Moon Knight was pretty good, but like it it's also very niche. Did we need a Moon Knight? Could we instead of use that to have a second season of WandaVision or a second season of Loki earlier? Like, did we need to then pump this character out? For what purpose is he going to serve? Because now I need to okay. keep track of Moon Knight. You're right. So it went WandaVision, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel, and then She-Hulk. I like She-Hulk, but She-Hulk. She-Hulk. I like She-Hulk. She-Hulk had, had an issue with it. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this to all those uh, right-wing bros out there. She-Hulk's issue was that it was a woman lead. Oh yeah, that was the only, that was the, literally the only thing people, and that's another thing, they're focusing more now on stories of actual superheroes that are minority superheroes or or female identified superheroes, and it's lo making folks lose their mind, and that's also why I think that this is, not, is tanking, because no matter what going in, it's already getting rated one star without even airing an episode or a minute of screen time, and folks are hyping it up as being a bad film that we're so quick to point out the flaws because we're going in knowing it's bad not realizing it's like they're all right films they're not awful they're not life-changing they're all right tv shows they're not awful they're not life-changing i do think the tv shows right now are stronger than the films but i think that tv is a as a longer format system or longer form content system just works better for some stories and i think that the spider-man films would do better as like a tom holland tv series because well, he's very bad guy of the week. That was the comic. Well, from what the reports are saying, and this is this is where I I think this is where my excitement for the Marvel Cinematic Universe and uh, superhero movies in general has just completely died. So now they're bringing in the Sony movies into the fold of the cinematic universe. So now you can't just have to watch the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You have to watch movies like Venom. You have to watch movies like Madam Web. You have to watch movies like uh, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. And uh, the new Craven, the, the Hunter. You have to watch all Morbin these. time. What? It's Morbin time. Morbius. Oh, Morbius. Yes, that's right. That, uh, as much as, yeah. And that's weird because one of my favorite actors is in that movie. But anyway, so you have to watch all these movies now to understand what's going on. So Marvel, maybe it's time to just sit back, relax, and enjoy your ride. 
Well, that's the thing. Chill out. Do we need 800,000 things? Let's focus on what we have. No. Let's make a story with what we have right now. Let's yeah. start killing off characters, removing characters, retiring characters. We don't need 75 characters to be in this story. Yeah. I and don't they, need it. They are pumping and the if they are they're putting all their eggs in one basket right now. And that basket is Deadpool 3 with fucking Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. They are hoping that this will sort of resurrect the X -Men. Marvel, the cinematic universe, so that way people are more interested in going back. So they better get that right because a lot of fanboys don't take kindly to getting things wrong around here. It's you. You are fanboy. I was not anymore. Not anymore. Um, so we are forty minutes into this. And I want to ask, because we're, we usually start looking at the future and we start talking about what's coming up, but it is Christmas. And I've got to ask a very poignant Christmas celebration question. What are some of the Christmas movies that you'll be watching over this Christmas break, or are you going to try to watch some? I feel like there's... I don't... My husband watches all the same ones every year. And this year I've just not been feeling like what I've just not been feeling like watching TV and movies. Like unless I'm super into it, I'm like, mm. and I don't know why this year I'm just like not caring as much about last Christmas because we were in New York and basically we'd go see a show and then we'd come home. We watch a Christmas movie at the, our friend's apartment. And so like, we didn't do that this year. So I'm kind of just in like a, eh, who cares about Christmas movies sort of phase. Um, I love Christmas movies. I just, I don't know. I, they're so cheesy. They're so corny. And I just don't have this mental capacity to deal with that right now. Um, and it also doesn't help that I'm behind on my reading goal because I'm trying to hit 100 books. And I've basically been playing catch up because I did too many theater things and didn't read for like a few weeks and then fell very behind. So I'm just like, I'm focusing on that. And I'm just finding that the books I've been reading have been more engaging than the stuff I've been watching. Because like, let's be very, very honest with ourselves. Hallmark movies are not the pinnacle of film. And they, they're they not. I'm sorry. They, and they're the only ones who do primarily Christmas movies. And Netflix Christmas movies, again, are not the pinnacle of film. Um, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. <laughs> That's okay. Basically, I'll be wrong. I will be wrong did. here. No, actually, I agree with you. Um, you watch one Harm Hallmark movie, you've watched all of them. Like I yeah. said, girl moves out. Girl has to go out to the countryside to go close up her pa's shop and falls in love with her uh, best friend from high school who was overweight at the time and now has lost all that weight and he is good looking now. And then in that, she finds the true meaning of Christmas. And the true meaning of Christmas was friendship and community all along. Or my new favorite of the genre, Big City Gay goes back home to help close up Christmas shops, save Christmas parade, whatever, and runs into former crush who either one of them was one of them was not out at the time of high school. And then now the uh, they find out and then they go and they decide to date and then he decides to give it all up to date crush from high school in small hometown, usually with gay icon as mother. Yes, usually it's uh, what's her name from uh... Fran Drescher, Brooke Shields, I think was one of them. Or uh, what's her name from uh, White or uh, Oh My God, Two Broke Girls. I can picture Jennifer Coolidge. <laughs> Jennifer Coolidge. Like there's always like a, a gay icon that folks literally love. Like a, a Jennifer Coolidge, a Brooke Shields, a Susan Sarandon, like a, something like that. Like Mary man, Steinberg. Mary Steinberger. Like the, it's... <laughs> It's just one of those. It's like, all right, I'll take it. I do like the, the gay ones. They they will watch. Everyone will watch. It's all the same, and it's all the same. Like, all right. So, and TV's been kind of dead, and the movies have been kind of dead because of the writer strike. So it's like, all right. So, I haven't seen Ballads of Songbirds and Snakes yet, and I heard that's reinvigorated everybody's hyperfixation on the Hunger Games. 
Okay, so my daughter-in-law told me that she, uh, well, she didn't tell me. She told my husband who told me because, <laughs> you know, I don't actually talk to my family. I get everything secondhand through family um, that it's actually a really good movie. It is yeah, a I've really good movie. And I'm like, this is weird coming from her because usually if she <laughs> she calls or text messages, something's up. So and we were like, what do you want? <laughs> no, we just want to talk about movies. It's like, this is unusual. <laughs> Hi, Zara. I really, I, I read, I really like the book. I'm excited to see the movie. Um, oh, so I, that's what's coming out this week too, this month too. Fuck, I forgot about that. Oh, thank you. What? <laughs> Percy Jackson and the Last Olympians are coming. Oh coming. yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, Christmas is back on. <laughs> are Percy you going to be okay if it's lackluster? Oh, if it is, I'm going to punch somebody. <laughs> they have been developing though this since Disney Plus was created. They've been trying to, and then but the issue is now that the guy who plays Hades passed away, and God rest his soul, it's going to be hard to do see uh, book two, three, and four because Hades is a main character in all of them. <laughs> There's a way to recast him. Oh, they will. They, it's it'll be the Oracle from the uh, um, from the Matrix, right? find another black actress to come in and play the black actress's role, which is what they did for matrix. And I'm not trying to be rude there. It's just what they did. Right. Yeah. Well, even Dumbledore. Right. So it's just find a old white guy who looks like uh, Hades and we'll go be good. But for this, it's a black guy who's a, a African-American. I apologize. Um, who uh, plays the character. I can't remember his name right now. And he's a really good mm -hmm. actor and it's really bothering me. Like there's no tomorrow, but I am really looking forward to that because um, they have not really so that many new books and the chalice of the gods was mm, so I've never read those books and I've heard they're really good. So the original storyline, the six books of Percy Jackson and the, of the Olympians are really good. Really, really good. Like I would probably say probably in my opinion, better than Harry Potter, Twilight, uh, even Hunger Games, even the Divergent series. Then they get into like the oh my god something the nordic gods the nordic gods then the red pyramid and then they go and now they have something called rick riordan presents and rick riordan presents is good it's just they are trying to make a, a book cinematic world in all these books so now they're taking gods from Haiti and gods from Egypt and gods from Greece and uh, gods from uh, South America from uh, now they're they've introduced vampires in the last one so from Romania and now you have to read them all because there's subtle hints about each of the other stories that are coming out and you're like okay this is just really confusing uh, like I, I want to read a book for a book and not have to read 12 other books to understand this book please so please stop doing that please if you're listening to I don't... this right now I don't hate that though. I I really like the idea of like ancient mythology being adapted to a modern day like book universe. I started reading this year the Dark Olympus series which is a romance novel or is a romance romance world. It's it's 10 books that she's planning on writing, but she wrote a prequel book. So like there's 11 books that are going to be included in this. And I'm sure she'll write other prequels as she gets inspired for it. But they are, it is like a dark romance of the Greek gods taking place in this. Uh, Olympus is like an, a big major, like New York city style city that's secluded from the rest of the world. And like, it's just very like criminal gangstery and it's really wild it's it's smutty i'm not gonna sit there and lie to you it's a little oh, on the smutty it's side smutty because every time that it, michael reads it i know because he'll send me a message go have you read this book you need to read this book this book is amazing it's it's really it's well written and it's a good story i like the idea of adapting things like with american gods um by neil gaiman i like that idea of mythological like pantheons being adapted or having this like modern day explanation. I just think it makes a really compelling story because you have all this background that you don't necessarily need to write. You could, you go in, you kind of, you know how they interact with each other. You know how the gods do da da da. 
like you know who they are specific gods of and it can allow you to build upon this world more because there's all this like deeper understanding there and so like i like the idea of rick riordan doing that and well it's not in... him it's not him only it's like 12 different authors who are all oh that's really these. cool Oh yeah, like it's like he, he is he is basically the Kevin Feige of the Percy Jackson world and he has basically got all these sort of new independent up and coming authors who are really good in their own writing these stories and they say what do you want to write about here's sort of the guidelines and go and write something we'll read it and then we'll go from there. It's a really good concept. It yeah, I just, really like the concept. It, it's it's the idea. The idea though is you have to kind of read them in the order that they come out, and then you have to try to follow along the story. It's just it's a lot of reading, and it's a lot of reading, and it's a lot of books. So unless you don't go to the library like I don't, and you buy all of these books, that but are like this crazy. is the thing. It's accessibility. You have to, any kind of movie or film, you have to go pay for streaming or you have to go pay for it in the film. You have to physically, but like if you already are a big reader, yeah, you're going to go to the library anyways and you can rent it or borrow it for free. And so like it's that, it, it makes it more accessible. And like, if this is the only book series you care about, like you're going to make the time for no. it. No, exactly. And there's only three book series that I'll like, I'll religiously buy a new book that comes out. And that's Cassandra Clare. And that's uh, Rick Riordan, any of his books. And then that's Tom Clancy. And those are the only three that I'll be like, okay, there's a new book coming out. Like, I know there's one that's coming out from Tom Clancy, which is 750 pages, which I'm not looking forward to because some of their new stuff that they're coming out with the Jack Ryan novels are so dry. It's like you're pulling teeth, but Overall, it's a good storyline and it keeps it going. And sometimes they'll throw in a random like, OK, this happened between this book and this book. And you're just getting a little bit more detail. So it, 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 I, I, I understand. It's just when when you're constantly pumping out six books a year and I have to read all those. Six books That's where it's a concern. It's that yes. quantity versus quality. Like I just read uh, a book that came out in 2019 and like we st- he's like, oh, there's going to be a sequel at some point. And it's. 2023 and there's still no sequel and i'm like okay this book was actually very good i thought it was new it was not it was it's an older book and i'm i would love a sequel of it and like i'm finding that the we are doing a trilogy that is it half the time i'm like this is a great world you've built i would love more for it and i would read like a longer series of it but then i don't want it to get to the level of that where it's like so grotesque that like seven books a year are coming out that i have to get all of them to read it or borrow all of them to get there like what if I don't have time in the year and I can't, then I'm like, now I have to read 12 books to understand this one. Like, so I get that. We so can slow just, it down, Rick. Yeah. So in 2023 alone, Winston Chu versus the Whimsies came out in February 6th. Last Canto of the Dead came out May 16th. The Fallen of uh, the Last Fallen Realm came out June 6th. The Furry of the Dragon Goddess came out August 1st. The Spirit Glass came out September 5th. Sura Botwig Guide to Witchcraft and Mayhem came out September 12th, a week hmm. after the last episode. Dawn of the Jaguar, October 10th. A week later, Fox Snare came out on October 17th. And the next one comes out on June, January 16th. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight books. And already in 2024, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven books that are coming out. And that's not even pre, like, what dates they're coming out. It's just in 2024, these are the books that are coming out. I think because he's he is a young adult writer, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Like, it, it is in the same realm of uh, Harry Potter. They came out at the same time. Actually, Harry Potter, uh, Percy Jackson came out a little bit earlier than Harry Potter, but Harry Potter took off. And then Percy Jackson kind of had the same following, but it wasn't as big as because the movie sucked for Percy Jackson. And I'll just be blunt about that. Yeah, I, I think that it's also with kids, like if this is a kid's favorite author and kids are not big readers usually, if like this is the way to get them to read eight books a year, I also don't hate that. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It's just, it's following the continuity because like I said, all these different people, all these, all those seven books that I just mentioned, all, all of them came out by somebody that was not the same author of the, the previous book. So it's all different writing styles, which is good. It's just very yeah, and then be- trying to remember 45 different characters and then you read the next. No, I get that. I fully get that. Yeah. I 
So okay. yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to 2020 now. 20 December 20th, 2023. Come on, last Olympian. That's all I can say. Um, so with that, I have one last subject, and then we are gonna wrap up here because we are at the hour mark. We just passed the oh. hour mark. Um, and that is award season. It is officially kicking off. <coughs> Critic Choice Awards came out uh, today as of recording. The uh, Golden Globes are coming out on Monday, December 11th. The Oscar nominations are probably going to be coming out in 2024. Um, is this this is going to be a fun season? Annual bet, as always, my good sir. Sure is. So for those who don't know, our annual bet is who knows movies better than each other. So we sit down and we watch every single movie, as many movies as we possibly can find that are in the public domain or go out and uh, watch them at the movie theaters. Um, Any movies, uh, uh, long shot predictions on who is going to potentially be taking uh, home some awards this year besides Mr. Ken? No, I think Barbie's going to get, I know you don't like the costumes. I'm telling you i think it's gonna be a costume winner but that's the thing i've not seen a lot of these films i've not a lot of them i'm looking at the predictions for the gold golden globes and i'm like oof i might just want to start watching some of these now? in the, like now if i can or when the golden globes get announced because you usually can see that um maestro is on netflix i didn't realize that that might be a tonight watch and i've only heard good things about it so far yeah, I've heard really good things too. It might um, be Mr. Cooper's fi- uh, first win. Yeah, he is being predicted as the first pick, but also uh, Oppenheimer I've heard was good. I've heard Killers of the Flower Moon is good. I really want to see Saltburn. So I've heard different things about Killers of the Flower. Uh, yeah, I've heard people either love it or hate it. And my friend who is very much like into social justice, she loved the film. And I'm like, all right, I think I might enjoy it then. But I don't know. I don't know much. Of, I, I only know it's Leonardo DiCaprio. And I know that there's been controversy with it. And Brandon Fraser. Oh! Yeah! After the win for Whale, they uh, they hired him and they re- uh, filmed. Hmm. So. Yeah, I'm really curious on what's going to get nominated this year. And it's hard because like, I don't want to watch something that I might hate for the Golden Globes that has zero actual chance of getting nominated for the oscars because like that sometimes happens things get nominated because the hollywood foreign press eats it alive and then it gets to the well, uh, because American... then they have the they have the comedy and the drama series yeah. where it's just best actor and all that um so uh the one that i want to watch and this is this it just came out recently and i'm just a big fan of him is paul giamatti's the holdovers set in boston so that's the one i'm looking forward to i think paul giamatti can do no wrong he's a really good actor and i think when he gets uh, a good script like this one which is from the writer and director of the movie sideways with him and thomas hayden church i think it's going to be a good movie that's just my own personal opinion it's being predicted for grammys not grammys uh golden globes we also have the color purple is not being thrown up here for nominations and there's a lot of folks going around saying that we could probably see that get nominated for the oscars and win the oscars but because of the format that they do it doesn't qualify for this year yeah so like a lot of these also won't be competing against necessarily everything that the oscars will have them competing against no, so that's why I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna start watching some of the movies that are nominated because, they're, like you said, it's a good indication. Then you might only yeah. have to pick up like three or four. But as always, we're hearing it here first. The 2024 Oscar prediction show is going to be coming in probably February. Be sure to tune into that. That I think in March is the actual show as well. So it is always a pleasure to lose to you because i often lose royally <laughs> last two years i've lost that that no, is last be- year my score was so good uh i i'm just saying the only reason you won the first year is because jessica chastain did not do a good job but the oscars thought she did so anyway and then the, then last year i you can say you won but i i still beat you in one category and that's all that matters 
you did beat me in that category. I'm a little surprised that she won it. I'm going to be honest. And like, no shade to Miss Jamie Lee Curtis. I'm just shocked over the win. And Why? that's because Angela Bassett did a thing. Well, yes, but also like, throw she back wasn't to January's strong... episode, everyone. <laughs> she wasn't the strongest in the category. And like, there's only been a handful of movies that have won three of the four acting categories. And so that's where it's like, you compare it with like Streetcar Named Desire. I don't think Everything Everywhere All at Once was as strong as Streetcar Named Desire in terms of acting. And like, that's just the reality of it. No shade to any of them. And I loved Everything Everywhere. I just think when you look at and you compare that, it's like, are they on the same footing in terms of performance? And I don't know. I don't know. Well, if there's anything that we should take away from last year, just check out A24's list of movies that they released in this month, and that will probably be more than likely on the Oscar ballot in 2024. Yeah. Uh, Michael, it is always a pleasure to sit down with you and chat about movies, the entertainment industry, sex tapes, and uh, books. <laughs> no, sex tapes. Well, we spent a good 20 minutes in the first I know segment. we did. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Michael. It's always a pleasure to sit down with you. Happy Hanukkah to those who are listening about the Jewish uh, faith. Uh, my f- family and I will be lighting the first uh, a candle on the 6th. So please say your wishes to your Jewish family. Uh, Ju- say your wishes. Say your uh, happy Hanukkahs to your Jewish friends and neighbors out there. So, Michael, always a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. Yeah, anytime. As always, he is not Mike Nichols. I am not Chris Brown. He is Mike Nichols, and I am Chris Brown. This is No, Not Them.